session. This is the NISLI Interactive Virtual Event Personal Projects on the NISLI Korean Program. My name is Alexander and I work for the NISLI team at Iron USA. And my colleagues at Ligaya and Kaya will be helping out with this event as well. Uh, I'm so glad that you're able to join us this evening. Before we start the presentation today, let's quickly go over some functions in Zoom as well as the outline for the event. Um, make sure to rename yourself so that we see your first name, um, and please be sure to be muted while presenters or our fellow attendee is speaking. And video is optional during the presentations and afterwards, so feel free to put it on or off as you wish. So the event is going to start with a brief introduction to the NISLI program, and then just a quick question I'm gonna ask through the poll feature. Then each of our four alumni panelists is going to give a presentation. And after that time, after all four presenters have gone, we will have a Q&A session with the panelists. So while they're presenting, think of any questions you may want to ask um, so that you're ready when the time comes for the Q&A session. During that time, you'll be able to use the raise hand function to be called on, or you could type directly into the chat. You can also send your questions to me and I can ask the presenters themselves as well. As a reminder, this event is going to end at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Before our speakers present, I wanna give some background information for anyone not familiar already with the NSLIY program or NISLI. Next slide, please. So the National Language Security Initiative for Youth or NISLI is a program of the US Department of State Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. Every year, NISLI brings around 600 students overseas to study a critical language such as Arabic, Chinese, Hindi, Indonesian, Korean, Russian, Turkish, and Persian for a summer or academic year. Students on the NISLI programs immerse themselves in the local culture, practice citizen diplomacy, and work to become experts in their language. The NISLI program has a lifelong impact, and I think our speakers today are going to attest to that. Before we get started, I just wanted to do a quick poll to see who our audience is made up of. So I'm gonna throw that up there and feel free to answer the question and also write anything in the chat if you feel it's not captured by this multiple choice question. So which of these most accurately reflects who you are and why you're joining us today? Do people see the poll? Okay, let's just wait a few more moments for people to answer the question. The guy or Kyle, are you able to see the results? It's not showing up on my screen. Okay. <laughs> well, having some technical trouble here. So maybe you can, okay, you can see the results. Can someone share the results? Or maybe Emma, do you want to share? I can share. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Poppy. <laughs> Okay, so for the first one, it was the prospective applicants to the Nisli Korean program is 43%. Nisli Korean alumni was 24%. Prospective applicant to Nisli program of another language was 10%. Nisli alum of another language, 2%. Parent of prospective applicant was 4%. Nisli staff, 2%. And then other was 16%. Great, thank you so much. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty there. So it's nice to hear that we have a wide range and a lot of people who are interested in the Korean program. So without further ado, let me introduce the four NISLI alumni of the Korean program who will be presented today. And first up we have who you just heard from, Poppy, who is an alumnus of the 2019-2020 Korean Academic Year program in Seoul, South Korea. Next fall, he will be a freshman at York University majoring in biomedical science and linguistics with a minor in Korean. Poppy is passionate about language learning and plans to use these skills to become a medical translator and interpreter in the future. Then we have Zach. Zach is an alumnus of both the NISLI 2018 Korean Summer Program and the 2019-2020 Korean Academic Year Program. 
He is a freshman studying economics and mathematics at Tulane University. He plans on formally continuing his language studies through college study abroad programs, and he enjoys spending his time hiking and cycling. Next up, we have Lucas. Lucas is a current NISLE 2020-2021 Korean Academic Year student and an alum of the NISLE 2019 Korean Summer Program. He plans on attending university in the fall and hopes to work in South Korea in the fields of television and broadcasting in the future. And last but not least, we have Emma, who is an alumna of the NISLE 2016 Korean Summer and 2018-2019 Korean Academic Year programs. Currently a sophomore at Columbia University with the intention of double majoring in political science and East Asian studies. Her participation in NISLE fostered a passion for language learning and an appreciation of being inquisitive, which she hopes will continue to lend themselves to her future endeavors domestically and abroad. Thank you so much for joining to all four of you. And for those who are not able to join us live today, we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our NISLE interactive website at a later time. Um, I'm now going to pass it off to our alumni panelists to begin with their presentation. So, Poppy, uh, please go ahead. Okay, so here. <laughs> Hello, guys. My name is Poppy Prieto, and as you just heard, I was part of the 2019-2020 Korean Academic Year. I was in Seoul, South Korea for the duration of my program, and I am also a member of the Inclusion, Diversity, Equality Abroad, or the IDEA Committee, which I can talk about later at the end if anyone's interested in that. Uh, so a little intro about my presentation, it'll look and kind of is formatted a little differently than the presentations after me. Um, and that's because while I was in Korea, my personal project was about the history of Korean organized crime. And I'll talk about it a little bit, but instead of just rambling on about, you know, kind of a gory mob subject, I wanted to talk about how adjusting to life abroad and how I realized life in Korea was pretty much exactly the same, just entirely different than life in America through an informal personal project. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, before going to Korea, I had many preconceived notions about what I thought my experience abroad would be like. And the first step of adjusting abroad was breaking those notions into three separate categories. Uh, the first was being what would really happen. And this included all realistic views of my language learning progression, my relationship building skills, and overall my daily life experiences. The second category was what I ideally wanted to happen, and that was all related to the language goals I had set for myself and all other opportunities I could take advantage of while abroad. The third category is the nightmarishly bad things that would kind of pop into my head like, oh, I won't be good enough, or I don't know enough Korean, things like that, and other fears. <laughs> Just a moment. Sorry, I got ahead of myself, but things like that and other fears. And breaking it down into those three categories really allowed myself to realize what I wanted to do for an informal personal project. And for this project, I found small things that were similar in American and Korean cultures. And finding those similarities helped me adjust to life in Korea because it's not very different at all. The informal personal project that I had made for myself was a mind growth opportunity, and it made adjusting to life in Korea easy. The hardest adjustment is always mental, and so once you get that first mental adjustment, the rest kind of follow suit. Uh, next slide, please. So in my informal uh, project, I realized that all of my personal interests, they're going to be the same no matter where I'm at. I'm a big sports person. I really like sports. I play a lot of sports, watch a lot of sports. Uh, so while I was in Korea, I found and immersed myself in Korean sports that I really enjoy, like baseball and figure skating. Um, Sports was a really big aspect that brought me close with my host mom. We would just sit and watch baseball for hours. We would talk through the entire game. Uh, sports terminology is really similar. There's a lot of cognates. So I was actually able to have my first full blown conversations and build a relationship with my host mom all because of baseball. Another thing that was pretty much the same no matter where you're at is music. American music and Korean music are very different, especially with like pop music. K-pop is very big in Korea, obviously. It's also gaining speed in America, but it's the exact same no matter where you're at. You'll be walking around downtown Korea, you hear a K-pop song, you get it stuck in your head and you're singing it over and over again just like you would with a pop song in America, you don't even realize that you're singing it in Korean. And so moments like that, where I would be singing a K-pop song in my head, saying all the words, and I realized that I was fully being adjusted to life in Korea through music. Next slide, please. 
And then similar to music is social networking and social media sites like Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, they're all the same apps that you have in America and using them provides the fullest immersion into culture and it allows you to experience real world interaction with people around your same age group, just like you would in America. You can send all those funny Korean memes that you've just now learned about and you just now understand. You can send them to your Korean friends just like you would with anything in America. Similar to that is the most important thing, that's why it has three exclamation points, is movies. Uh, for me personally, movies were a very important thing in being adjusted to Korean life. Uh, me and my host brother watched every single James Bond movie as part of my informal personal project. There are 22 James Bond movies. That's a lot of James Bond, a lot of hours to put into any project, but it was the most crucial part of being adjusted to life in Korea in my language learning process. While I was watching these movies, I wasn't even thinking about reading the Korean subtitles. I was just reading them because James Bond, still James Bond, no matter what country you're in. And related to that, I watched a lot of mafia and mob movies. My actual personal project that I did while I was in Korea was about mob history. And me and my group analyzed mob related movies in Korea. And I found out exact same stories that were going on in America had happened similarly in Korea. So through media, you kind of realize that it's all the same, no matter where you're at. Next slide. And then lastly is academics. And this was kind of a big topic. Obviously this scholarship is an academic based scholarship. So you'll have a lot of questions about how the academic life is abroad. And I'll say very similar. <laughs> and I have a lovely quote said by Lindsay Lohan playing Katie Heron in the movie Mean Girls, where she states that math is the same in every country because it is the exact same no matter where you're at. Um, Realizing that learning is still learning no matter where you're at, no matter what subject, it could be math, English, anything like that, you're still learning it and it's, it's still the same no matter where you're at in the world. Um, my personal project uh, was a very hard thing for me to do. I planned it all out kind of before I left for Korea and then while I was in Korea it kind of exploded into something something else that I wasn't <laughs> sure was going to happen, uh, but these small differences that I found in these small things that were exactly the same, it made adjusting to life in Korea so much easier because no matter where you're at, people still have sports, there's still music, there's still movies to watch, anything like that. Life is the same no matter where you're at. And at the beginning, I said it's in exactly the same, entirely different because it is. Conceptually, we're all the same and there are small nuances that are different. And if you only look at the same parts at the beginning, it makes the steps <laughs> to having everything adjust much easier. And next slide. And then if anyone has any other questions about anything like that, um, you can contact me. My Instagram is up here as well as my email. I will try to respond to everything. Just any questions that you have, feel free to send them to me. And thank you guys. I think Zach is next as well. So good luck, buddy. Okay, hey, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Zach Ramsey, and today I'm going to briefly introduce the Nisley, per Nisley Y Personal Project, summarize my project, and conclude with some takeaways I learned over the course of my research. Next slide, please. So, the Korean Academic Year Personal Project, also referred to as the Hanmi Cultural Project, is a two month long research project undertaken during the Korean school break. Nisley Y students are paired with a college student. A mentor as they together explore a subject of mutual interest. The Hanmi project is completely open-ended and it's the hidden gem of the academic year program. It provides students with the necessary organizational and linguistic skills to perform professional work in their target language. Next slide, please. So starting off initially why I had broad interest in Korea concerning its colonial history with Japan and its sudden economic resurgence in the latter half of the 20th century. So I sat down in a coffee shop with my advisor and in Korean, we eventually whittled down these broad ideas and chose to study the economic impact and cultural changes regarding the relocation of the US military headquarters from Seoul to Pyeongtaek, Korea. Ever since the armistice agreement between North and South Korea, the United States has held a military presence in South Korea under the name USFK, or United States Forces Korea. 
Up until 2018, the USFK had their health held their headquarters at the former Yongsan garrison, which sits on the south side of Namsan Tower, almost directly in the center of the Seoul metropolitan area. For comparison, imagine Central Park, but as a foreign military compound. Citing impracticality, strategists uh, relocated the headquarters of USFK south to Camp Humphreys, located in Pyeongtaek, Korea. Uh, next slide, please. For the research, I conducted a series of interviews with American officers from USFK, embassy officials, and Korean citizens of Pyeongtaek. My mentor helped identify key documents and municipal reports on the issue in Korean. Additionally, my mentor and I received funds to travel to Pyeongtaek to experience firsthand the rapid development of the city. The final project was a written report in Korean and a speech given at the Hanmi Project conclusion event. So this photo, uh, this was taken with my mentor. We traveled down to the port and we were just touring the industrial zone. Uh, next slide, please. What we eventually concluded was that this move was not a trivial move decision of administrative policy. The move was a significant current event. Currently, Camp Humphreys is the largest US military base abroad and it cost the US and Korean governments over $11 billion for its construction. Although the full extent of the cultural influence of Camp Humphreys in, on Pyeongtaek, Korea is yet to be realized. It will undoubtedly be a frontier of exchange between US military families and Korean citizens. Next slide, please. Lastly, I would like to outline what I believe to be the three dimensions of the Hanmi project. In a sense, these are the key takeaways I obtained from completing my project. And the dimensions are as follows. It's language, ambassadorship, and history. Next slide, please. Language acquisition is the heart of the Nisli Y program. Conversations with schoolmates, host parents, or people encountered in a restaurant are all meaningful ways of increasing conversational fluency. However, the US Department of State does not want to cover program expenses so students can get good at small talk. The US Department of State wants to mold the next generation of intercultural leaders in business, government, and beyond. Ultimately, this goal can only be accomplished through professional proficiency. My Hanmi project forced me out of my language comfort zone and forced me to express ideas concerning history, economics, and public policy. Completing the project led to the acquisition of relevant vocabulary words. Um, for example, when I was going through my project, a lot of the words were specific to like US military terms, like uh, USFK in Korean would be Juhan uh, Next slide, please. The second dimension of the cultural project is ambassadorship and life abroad. The Nisli White program aspires for students to become model citizen ambassadors in their host country through meaningful cultural dialogue. Something that became especially clear when conducting interviews of the residents of Pyeongtaek was the great diversity of US resident relations that existed. The three ways in which most Koreans interact with Americans on a personal level are through official ambassadors, citizen ambassadors, and military officials. While living, as an, living abroad as an American, one's actions are reflective of American culture and American values. This is the whole concept of being a citizen ambassador. But what I propose is that this concept can be applied to the personal project. The research Nisli Y students conduct while abroad in, is in itself a form of ambassadorship. The projects we choose, what we think is interesting and novel about Korea, for instance, all reflects back on our American values. There is a misconception that research should be done as objectively as possible, but that undermines the existence of a two-way stream of information. Examining my project in particular, yes, I did conduct interviews of Pyeongtaek citizens, and I got interesting information from their testimony, but the Koreans I interviewed also simultaneously discovered more about American interests in Korean society. In particular, I remember there was one interview with a recent college graduate who was working in Pyeongtaek, and he was just kind of astonished at why I was asking him all of these specific questions about the military base, because nobody had ever approached him and asked him those sort of questions before. Next slide, please. The study abroad experience is directly offended, affected by politics and the various happenings of the world. The utility of reviewing our personal research projects through historical perspectives is that we can view our personal experiences through the uh, incredible scope of larger movements and see our small corner in the tapestry of global history. 
through the personal project, Listen Why students are presented the unique opportunity to conduct research in the moment. Accordingly, research projects are gonna have a certain historical dimension to them. Going back to my project that is, as an example, I can say I am very pleased after the fact to have chosen a project that was so pertinent in the time. Uh, I think 2019 to 2020 was really one of the last years where you could live in Seoul and you could see and hear American helicopters fly straight into the Yongsang base in the middle of the day. So my advice to any applicants out there is, or current students is to do something bold that only you can do while you're abroad. When eager high school students with international ambitions apply to Nisley Y, they are confronted with a barrage of essay questions in the online application portal. Year after year, one question that's always asked of applicants is why do you want to study abroad? What do you hope to accomplish? Ultimately, the Hanmi Cultural Project is the living answer to that question. The personal project is an opportunity to critically engage with research in the host country. During the personal project, students are afforded the responsibility to take their Nisiwai experience and truly make it their own. The Hanmi Cultural Project is not a pastime activity meant to occupy students' schedules while school is out of session. It's its own unique academic pursuit. It demands devotion and wholehearted engagement and research. What one puts into their Hanmi project is what one gets out of it. Okay. I think it's Lucas, your turn. Thanks for passing it off to me. All righty. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lucas. Um, I'm currently an academic year participant. And uh, so I guess today I'm going to outline and, and talk to you a little bit about um, my peer project and uh, what I've been up to this year so far. Um, so I guess to start, um, we break up our peer projects this year, uh, one per semester. So for our first semester, we ended up talking about Korean history. This was our umbrella topic. And specifically, um, we decided that it would be very interesting if we ended up talking about Korean and American protests and demonstrations and civil rights. Um, as I'll talk a little bit more um, about as, as I go on here, um, I think it's very interesting the similarities that the two countries actually have in, in, in those fields. Um, so I guess to start and, and kind of outline how we conducted our meetings uh, online, um, each week we would meet with a Korean college student who is actually majoring in Korean history. Um, so each week we would uh, present on American civil rights related topics and also receive presentations back to us um, about Korean demonstrations and protests, um, all in Korean. So, so during our meetings, we would have to prepare about our, our given topics and be ready to, you know, know all the vocab and whatnot to, to explain the, the significance of what was going on here in America and also be ready to receive um, all the information about uh, what we're learning in Korea. So um, specifically, uh, I want to talk about uh, the things that I felt in particularly uh, impressed upon as, as we did this project. I thought that, um, that learning about our host country's history um, is very important just when you're engaging in a new language and a new culture. Um, and I think that just naturally, Nisli is uh, mostly a, a language learning program. I mean, the bulk of it is, is sitting in class and engaging with the language. And I think because of that, it's very easy to overlook the other parts of the culture, say the history, for instance. So I thought that being able to get a better perspective of, of Korean history was really valuable for me. Um, going on, I, I think that one of the most interesting and enthralling aspects of doing this kind of project was learning about the similarities between um, the two cultures and how we have so much in common in terms of protests and demonstrations and civil rights. I mean, just to name a few examples, um, some of our meetings we were talking about things like women's suffrage in America and also that in, in, in Korea, as well as some of the, the 1980 student protests that went on in Korea and comparing that to lots of the civil rights protests that we had um, in the United States. Um, I think that these countries are you know, pretty different. I think it's pretty, pretty safe to say that uh, Korea and the United States are pretty different countries, but I think that getting a real intimate connection um, with uh, someone from Korea and being able to learn more about um, how we really are a lot more similar than we might think at first was, was very interesting and very valuable to me in particular. Um, I also think it's very valuable to be able to learn about history from two different perspectives. So I, I suppose a, an easy example here from my personal experience is, well, throughout high school during my my third year US history course. When it came to Korean history, we, we really only learned about the Korean War. And, and even when we did that, it, it was usually only under the umbrella of 
uh, communism and one of the events that followed World War II. But through being able to talk with somebody who majored in Korean history, um, I think you, you're able to gain a more complete perspective, um, which is very important when you're tackling another culture and trying to engage with the language. I also think, although this may not be a specific point in, in terms of culture or history, um, I thought it was very, very interesting and, and fun to be able to talk with a Korean peer and establish a real positive connection with uh, my target language. So during our meetings, um, being somewhat of a beginner makes the whole process of tackling American historical events and explaining the significance of each of those um, not an easy thing to do. Um, and there are plenty of times where I was stumbling through my words and trying to figure out what the right uh, words to, to use would be to you know, explain this properly um, in Korean. And although it was very difficult, I think that it was just as equally fun. Um, I remember having a meeting and having to explain things like affirmative action and the, the Rodney King riots in Korean. And so trying to, to figure your way out through um, uh, heavy topics like that in a foreign language um, really makes for uh, an interesting and engaging experience that I, I think is very invaluable to um, learning a language. Uh, also, on the right here, I, I thought it would be a fun thing to throw in. Um, we do have a picture from one of our meetings, um, all of us wearing interesting hats, um, because I thought that, you know, might be a, a fun way to spice things up during the meeting. Um, on the left there is uh, me wearing a cowboy hat. It was just what I thought of when I thought of traditional American culture. Uh, and on the right is our Korean peer who uh, was wearing a hat that she received in Vietnam as part of um, a study abroad. So if we could go on to the next slide. Perfect. Um, our second semester project was less of, um, say, specific, cult or specific culture or events, but it was more of um, learning more about Korea as a whole. I think that when you learn a new language and you learn about a new na nation, it's very easy to only know that nation's uh, capital cities. So for South Korea, for instance, um, it's Seoul and Busan. And usually, if you don't know much about Korea, you don't know much outside there. I mean, going into this project, I had no idea that a place like Gangwon existed. Um, so during our meetings each week, we would have different excursions. So uh, one week we went to Gangnam's beach or Gangwon's beaches, and I was able to uh, get a better understanding of, uh, I guess, the the nature that exists in this province and, and how it has a really tranquil uh, environment. Um, and in another different uh, excursion, we went to Ojukon, which is uh, the house of a very famous Korean philosopher. Um, and while we were there, we were actually able to look at his texts and um, books that he wrote as he was studying. Uh, we also ended up going to the Pyeongchang Olympic Stadium, um, where the Olympics were held in 2018. And we also were able to go to a traditional Korean market, which I thought also gave me a really good taste of, you know, Gangwon's nature. And if I could just say, Gangwon has some beautiful rivers and bridges, okay? So if you're planning on going to Korea, it's definitely a place worth checking out. Um, I also want to just emphasize here that aside from uh, the specific cultural, I guess, interactions that I was able to have. Um, I was able to connect with my Korean peer and establish like a real positive relationship with the language, um, which I think is super important. I mean, during one of our meetings, we didn't go anywhere. We just sat down and I watched my friend eat jang kalguksu, which is Korean noodles. Um, and, and while we did that, I was able to talk more about just the things that I like and talk about my likes and, and dislikes in, in the Korean language. Um, we even ended up sharing webtoon recommendations um, as we were talking which I, I thought was just a real positive experience. And I think it's experiences like those when you talk to other people who speak your target language that are going to solidify your, your motivation and trying to get better. I, I suppose if I could just finish this off with an idea that was on the previous slide. Um, I think that as you go forward in your language learning journey and trying to engage with another culture, you have to be ready for all the things that you're not going to expect when you start learning because lots of it will blow your mind, okay? There's so many experiences, places, um, people that you'll meet, even if it's online, um, or people that you're meet, gonna meet in person um, when you start engaging with a new language um, that you could not imagine happening um, if you just don't go out and take that chance. Uh, speaking from my 2019 experience, um, there were so many interesting people that I met even just walking through the streets. I've been confused and had conversations with other, pers with other people in Korea. Some people thinking I'm from Canada, I'm from Africa, I'm from France. I've even been told that I speak Korean with a Japanese accent, which I thought was very interesting. 
Um, there was one particular day where I pushed a person in a wheelchair up to a top of the hill. He ended up adding me on Pokemon Go afterward. <laughs> and then, of course, um, just another thing that I learned about broadcasting, because it was something that was really close to me. Um, did any of you know that Korea has been broadcasting professional video games on television since 1999? Um, that was just a fact that I had no idea about until I really started to engage with this language. So I, I guess if you're going forward and you're a prospective applicant or you're just really interested in languages and Korea, get ready for all the cool stuff that you're going to learn. That's all for me. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Emma now. Thank you, Zach, or Lucas. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. You did such a good job. Um, so I will round us off this evening. So during my AY program, we had two research projects that we conducted. The first one was done during winter break, and then the second one was done during like the last two months of the year. And so for both of my project topics, I focused on vulnerable groups of Korean society in which the discussion of them was kind of deemed a taboo subject. So for my winter break um, project, with along with a Korean college student and my best friend Katie, we learned about unwed single mothers. And then for my individual project, I focused on individuals with disabilities in specific learning and mental disabilities. And we, for the winter break project, this ended up culminating into a presentation and a video essay that we filmed and edited while the individual project that I did individually was more of a research paper essay type of situation. Next slide, please. So when it came to picking out these topics for my research, I, during the winter break, I kind of had this sense that the whole previous semester was very heavily focused on Korea's history and traditional culture, mostly because that was what our program excursions and class content generally focused on. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed learning all of this stuff. This is what first piqued my interest in learning about my host country and its rich culture. But I also wanted to focus more on current day Korea and society, the issues it was facing, the developments it was making, progress as well. And I think this was mostly sparked from my transition switching to a new host family during winter break, because then I had an older host sister where we would spend after dinner um, conversing about all sorts of topics under the sun, sharing a plate of strawberries and just discussing things from feminism to job market competition, beauty standards, all of that. And she was the one really that introduced me to um, taboo subjects and some marginalized groups um, living in Korea and society's perception on them. So she really um, pushed me to want to do a project on single mothers in specific. And at the time, I guess, it's quite naive to think back on, I had this um, assumption that history and society like present day was quite separated, that they could be separated. And so my mind was like, okay, first semester is history of Korea, second semester with my own projects, I'm going to focus on present day Korea. Um, but of course, that's not exactly how it works. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So I, to be frank, it probably was a lot to do with um, an American perspective at first. I was, it was a perspective colored with this sentiment in America that single mothers are really brave and courageous and heroes just like any other mother. Of course, in America, there's um, still people that will counter with negative um, comments about characteristics or abilities of these women. But overall, it's not a taboo subject to discuss um, single mothers or having grown up in a single um, parent household. But in Korea, that's a little bit different. Um, through research, um, I learned that unwed single mothers face a lot of adversity from financial difficulties, most of them living um, in poverty, as well as ostracization from society, as well as their family, because it's seen as something that's dishonorable and shameful, the mere existence um, and the idea of um, what single mothers are. And I quickly learned through this research project that this is not something that you can just take from the bigger picture and analyze it. It's so important to look at all the different aspects and the biggest aspect of all being history. And the origin of um, a society is just as important as where it is present day. And so I learned through this 
cultural epiphany of sorts, you could say, that history and culture do mutually interact. And that's just as, and learning about the history is important in understanding how we got to the place we are today, and especially how we can continue to better and make improvements and develop as well. So when it came to the conversation of single mothers, um, my group um, was able to research and find out that a lot of it, the perception of current day, a lot of it has to do with Confucian culture and this patriarchal family structure that emphasizes this like perfect family unit of like a two parent household and then children. And so it's these elements that are kind of interwoven into Korean society that makes this stigma um, that, that makes the stigma on um, single mothers. And so the normalization of this and kind of figuring out how we can normalize this and bring positivity back is, is only gonna be able to happen if we realize the um, beginnings of what brought up this type of thinking. Next slide, please. And so also besides this cultural knowledge that I was able to gain from um, doing these projects, also language learning is a very important aspect of course. Um, focusing on my second project more so here, conversation skills definitely matured um, and I was able to hold more complex discussions. And a lot of that had to do with the vocabulary that I was learning. Um, I had previously kind of had the thought that our classes focus a lot on vocabulary that voiced a lot of the past, learning about how to describe Korean traditions and describe Korean history um, and the celebrations we were having with our host family, things like that. And then as we got in later into the year, we were learning vocabulary that helped vocalize the present and the future, current developments and issues, especially with my class um, around this project time, we finally made it to the last book in our textbook series. And a lot of that content was overlapping with my project. There was even passages I would read in my textbook and then I'd be like, oh, can I cite this in my project because they made a really good point um, about perception and things like that. And so I was able to even use my written assignments and my presentation that we, that we had weekly in class to further discuss my project. Um, and besides for conversation, I think in my little umbrella of language learning, confidence is probably one of the things that I was most able to um, kind of nurture throughout this whole experience. Um, for me in my language learning journey, I've kind of come to this realization that despite as much passion as you might have or a great work ethic, or you may have like a photographic memory, if you don't have confidence in yourself and what you're saying, I feel like just the language is not gonna come. And that was definitely something that I struggled with you know, being, com being comfortable, being uncomfortable, getting out of my comfort zone, a lot of things that we've all discussed today already. Um, and the interview definitely allowed me to put that in the forefront and really, you know, take on this daunting task. Um, because everyday conversations are, of course, meaningful and fulfilling as well. But when it comes to an interview, it just felt that much more scary because it was a more formal environment and you're doing it with an unfamiliar person, a stranger who, and I mean, not that they'll judge you, but you know, it's not the same as talking to your host mom who you've seen in like every moment of the day. Um, and so for the first interviews I had was with my support of, with, was done with the support of my friends, my college, um, Korean supporter, and then Katie, and we went to Kumfa, which is a support organization for single mothers, and we also went to a shelter and interviewed um, the owner um, of a shelter, and that was a really great experience being able to, you know, prepare questions and, and practice being able to hold a conversation, and especially when we didn't understand, but being able to back that up with follow-up questions and ask clarifying questions and all of those things. It definitely was good preparation for when I did my own interview for my personal project, and I did that by myself without my sounding board, um, and so that was a moment where I was able to have a really strong sense of achievement because of course it was a little messy. I definitely made mistakes and stumbled, um, had to ask her to repeat herself, things like that. But overall being able to learn from her and her experience um, being a lawyer for discrimination cases for people with disabilities, it really helped aid my report and my project having that firsthand experience and being able to get that not just through reading an article but by my own like merit felt really good and, and specific that day is super memorable to me because at the end of the interview I had a very interesting elevator ride down 
because the interview was conducted on like the 12th or 10th floor of a building and the elevator was one of those that had like mirrors on all four sides so you could see yourself even if you didn't want to see yourself and I was quite sweaty but overall the smile on my face was so big and I couldn't help but squeal the whole way down because I was just ecstatic that I had done that and that I had all this information and it just felt good to I mean relieved to have it done and over with but also just good to know that I had done that and I had set my mind to it and you know with all of the things I'd learned throughout this entire year it culminated to this experience and it turned out to be really great for me and my confidence. <laughs> Last slide please. So yeah that's um, all I had to share about my experience with personal projects um, but if you have any further questions we don't get to them today you can feel free to contact me on social media or shoot me an email. I also have a blog um, where I detailed a lot of entries from my time in Korea including my research project um, and the presentation days and interview days if you'd like to check those out as well. But yeah thank you guys for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much to all the presenters. I really enjoyed hearing from you about your projects, about your personal experiences while on the program. It was really great. Um, and now we have time for some questions, um, maybe a little under 20 minutes. So as I said earlier to the attendees, please think of any questions you want to ask and you can use the raise hand function. I can call on you. You can type it into the chat. You can send me a private message. I see already one hand. Um, so let's get started. Um, I have some questions myself in case there are some other, there are some dead space at all. But uh, Maylin, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, my question is about how do you get over homesickness? Uh, I really went to Salvador, uh, my home country, and obviously with all COVID uh, precautions, um, I felt very homesick and I didn't get used to it until the fourth, fifth days of my of the visit um so my question is like just how to get over the home sickness does it last a while does it go away um what, what are some type of adjustments you guys took in order to uh what's it called i don't know lessen the homesickness i can go ahead and say that um one of the things that made me feel less homesick was definitely doing things and partaking in things that reminded me of home, um, but also still let me immerse myself in my host country as well. So I definitely miss my mom's cooking. That was one of the biggest things I missed, um, like my mom's Cuban food. It's really hard to find authentic um, food like that in Korea. So I made a day out of it instead and taught my host family how to make empanadas. And it was fun to be able to share that with them and have that moment. But then it also let me feel like I was, you know, back at home eating my mom's cooking and I was able to send her photos and talk to her about that as well. So I think that um, similarly to what Poppy's presentation talked about, finding things that, you know, remind you of home and like can take you there for even a few seconds um, and take you away from your environment, but also by, but also even by taking part of that in your country as well and, you know, sharing that with others, um, I think really helps with the homesickness. Yeah, to add on to that, I think another helpful thing was setting up a contact schedule with your family while you're abroad. Uh, so with my family, we didn't talk super regularly. I would try to video chat with them at least like once a month, or I think there was like one month where we like video called every week when I was first there. Um, but it was kind of just setting up a line of communication and having not necessarily a schedule, but carving out time of when you wanted to talk to your family. Uh, that really helped with homesickness as well. Great, thank you for sharing the responses to that question. I wanna go back to a question that, uh, Dar to two questions Darcy asked, and um, I'll direct this to Lucas, because um, uh, Darcy asked how you were able to collaborate on your project virtually, essentially, and also asked if the personal projects were graded or published in any way. Yeah, sure thing. So for both of the projects, we did about one hour, one hour meetings through Zoom. Um, so for the first one, because I, I suppose it was more research based, um, after the meetings and throughout the week leading up to the meetings, uh, we would do research on, I guess, previously decided Korean or Amer and American topic. Um, so that was usually our own personal research and we would try to include as much information as we thought was appropriate, um, specifically for the American um, presentations, because that was what we were actually 
I guess, informing our partner about. Um, and then we would also take notes during our presence or during our meetings as well, um, just so I guess we could get a little bit of a better understanding about all the um, events that were discussed. During our second project, uh, it was just, uh, it was a one-on-one -on -one and it was also through Zoom and we did a, a face call where our, my friend was in some area in, in her city and she would show me around um, through the camera and we would just have a tour and then she would ask me certain questions that I would ask her questions about the place. Um, maybe she'd tell me history, something like that, about wherever we were visiting. Uh, that was usually how we conducted our, our, our projects, yeah. Um, as for it being graded, um, Howard's didn't have a, a specific grade, but it was, how do I say, um, we received a, a certificate and we did end up having to turn in a, um, a project report at the end, um, detailing um, our, our meeting, I guess, content and also our, our feelings about um, the content that we learned. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you so much. So we have a lot of questions both like in the chat from raising hands from a few different ways. So I'm gonna to try to get to all of them. Uh, I'll address this question to Zach um, so we can hear from you. So someone asked if you could go back in time over the course of your studies, what is one thing that you might change if anything? So I was, um, I was on the 2019 to 2020 uh, NISLY academic year and that one fatefully ended with the coronavirus. So I would say one thing, um, if I could go back in time, knowing that the coronavirus happened, I would, I would take everything up to like a new level of intensity. Um, something I, I did during, I started doing during uh, spring break was I made like a bucket list of things that I wanted to do in Korea. But I would really suggest that people um, go into the program already having a list of some things that you're interested in doing and then just trying to like knock those things off the list. Um, yes, it's a really academically intense program, but you also need to make sure that you're having fun and just having fun really helps with uh, acclimating to the acclimating to culture shock, I'd say. Yeah. Great, thank you for the answer. Um, I'll call on Ryan now. I see you have raised your hand. Um, thank you guys uh, so much for all the presentations. I thought they were really amazing and I loved hearing about all your personal experiences. Really made me want to apply to the program even more. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask, like, I'm thinking about applying to the summer program and I don't know if the, like, due to con the constrained nature of the summer program, if the personal projects are a big part of the summer program and maybe could you go over some of the differences between the academic year program and the summer program? I guess I could start um, being one of the people here that has done both. Um, given my experience is just a little bit different because of you know the situation right now. Um, but during our summer, um, our summer program, um, we did uh, specific culture clubs instead of uh, a specific peer project. So for our culture clubs, um, I guess to give some examples, um, different students we, we'd break off into say one group did drumming, like traditional traditional Korean drumming, another one did. Um, fan dance, um, some did Taekwondo, and others did cooking. Um, so then it, during those meetings, they'd meet once a week um, and I guess per perfect uh, whatever they were learning. So like the fan dance at the end of the year, uh, they did, did, you know, the fan dance uh, cooking, they did a, a presentation on what they've, they've made throughout the year, or throughout the summer, sorry. Uh, the Taekwondo did um, a performance, they, they did some mar martial arts on stage, and then uh, drumming also did a performance as well. Um, I'd imagine if you're doing summer this year, um, where, or you end up having uh, a virtual experience, it'll be more similar to, I guess, my experience doing the uh, online, I guess, one-on-one, -on -one maybe talking to another Korean peer about, you know, culture and things like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, so Andrea uh, asked two questions and I'll address this to Poppy because you talked about adjustment a lot. So Andrea asked, what was something that gave you cultural shock on the program? And also asked, what is something that's totally unique to the AY Korean program? I think um, for the culture shock one, it was more of like the directness of Korean culture. Um, 
it, <laughs> there's a lot of experiences as I'm native and Mexican and a lot of people in Korea, they would look at me and not really know what ethnicity or anything I was. And so there was just a lot of direct staring. And in America, I feel like people would try to be, like hide it a little bit more. <laughs> like they'd kind of glance at you, but I would have so many times where I'd be like on the subway and an old lady would, I would, I wear hats all the time. So I'd be standing on the subway with a hat and an old woman would just come up and like tilt her head underneath to look at my hat and like see my face directly. Um, so that was the largest culture shock. That was pretty much one of the main things that was a hard adjustment of people will stare at you because you're a foreigner. And if they can't really tell where you're from, they will stare even harder. <laughs> and um, that was a little hard to adjust to, but after a while, you know, it's, they're honestly just like interested uh, a lot of people can come up and like talk to you about it. Uh, so for culture shock, I would say that was one of the hardest things to adjust to. And then the other one was about the academic year setup, was it? Yeah, just about one thing that's that you found really unique about the AY program. Okay, I really liked the aspect of actually going to a host school. I thought that was a very important aspect of the academic year program. You get to interact with kids that are actually around your age. For me personally, I had a host family that was relatively old. Both of their kids were um, already done with college. They had jobs, everything's like that. Uh, so I didn't really get to interact with anyone my age or like learn lingo and slang and like what the cool kids are doing, things like that. Uh, so having the host school, I went to Daewon High School, which was really fun. Uh, but having having a host school is, I would say, a very specific part of the academic year that I enjoyed the most. It allowed me to talk with more people, to really practice conversational Korean and be comfortable talking in Korean to people my own age, teachers even. Uh, so yeah, the whole school was probably my favorite academic year experience. Great. I, Poppy, it looks like there's some follow-up to <laughs> the school question, so maybe just if you can go on, some people are curious about whether you wore a uniform and what the days looked like, um, okay. and what kind of subjects you took. Okay, so for the uniform, we did have to wear a uniform. I actually still have mine. I took it with me because it was just a good, you know, good thing to keep. Um, my schedule was a little different because I lived very far away from my school. So I would have to wake up really early and commute to get to school. It took me about an hour and a half to get there. Uh, so my schedule was very long days, but I used the like subway time to study normally. But we had our uniforms, we would go, we wear, wear those every day. Uh, you go to school, after school, we would eat lunch and then we would all go to our Korean classes that you take uh, from the program. And then after classes, um, you could pretty much do whatever, but we did have a curfew. So after classes, you could go hang out with friends, anything like that, and then just be home by your curfew time. Great, thank you for sharing. There's at least two more questions I'm hoping to get to. Uh, one I received in message, so I'll direct this question to Emma. Um, so this person asked, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to the you know, future participants of the program, what would it be? And then on the other hand, another question was, how much free time did you have to devote on program to other activities like you know, hobbies of yours? Okay, so for one piece of advice that I would give, I would say that when it comes to, even when you're a beginner, um, if you're a beginner language learner, I think that um, just making sure to stay in your um, language as much as you can without using English um, to fill in can be really useful um, because 
that is how you can really get practice with speaking Korean. Even if it's hard to, even just miming it, body language, not resorting to English right away, because if you get into the habit of using English, I find that some people get comfortable with that language with a certain like host family member or a certain friend, and then that might be how the relationship stays. So trying your best to really immerse yourself by using um, your Korean skills, even if it's like baby talk, honestly, that's how little kids learn. So even if you're making a lot of mistakes and they're correcting you or you're you're not just you're not sounding the most eloquent as you would in English as long as you're putting yourself out there and speaking as much as you possibly can I think that that's how you're going to see your language skills really improving it's not just what you do in the classroom and the studying you do there and on paper what's really important is the effort you put like outside of that and when it comes to conversing with other people that you're really going to see the gains in language learning and then for the second question I think you meant it was about free time um, so as has been stressed a lot um, throughout this presentation, Nestle Y is definitely a very academically intense program. So you will be spending a lot of time um, studying, but of course you will have free time, especially on weekends if you um, plan around um, time that you want to uh, prioritize studying and then having other time in the day to hang out with your um, host school friends or to talk with your um, cohort, fellow cohort or your host family. Um, I definitely think that there is time in, in a week just to do one or two things that you really want to do um, e even if that's just as simple as going to a cafe and studying there taking your homework on the go and going to a park or a cafe can kind of blend those two worlds together you'll definitely have time to explore korea um, and learn a, a lot about it while studying and getting you know doing your best to learn korean great thank you um i'm gonna try to get like one or maybe two more questions, but we'll probably have to cut it off because <laughs> um, we are trying to end at 7.30. Um, but there was a question asked a few minutes ago um, and I'll pose this one to Zach. Um, so the question was, if you're still in touch with your friends or contacts in Korea and how has coming back to the US affect your relationship with them? Have you been able to stay in touch? Yeah, I'm definitely still in touch with a lot of my friends uh, in Korea. It's always hard to maintain a long distance relationship with someone. Um, but actually, it's funny because I was talking with my mentor for the personal project just uh, like, like I think two weeks ago. Currently, he's in Africa doing some um, NGO work, and I think it's really cool. But yeah, we try to keep in touch. Um, a lot of Korean people will use Kakao, the messaging service. Um, but yeah, I, I try to keep in touch with my friends, uh, my, not only my Nisli um, fellow cohort friends, but also the, um, my mentor at through my project and my school friends. Yeah, um, so I guess kind of going through the Nisley Y program, you should, you should try to like cultivate a group of, a close group of friends that um, you can maintain your relationships with after the program, I'd say, definitely. Great, thank you. So, okay, there's many questions and I simply won't be able to get to them all, um, sadly, although alumni did forget provide uh, their contact info, but I'm gonna ask one more question and I'll ask it of Lucas. Um, so the question is, what do you think is one of the things that made you a good fit for the Nisley program? <laughs> good question. Um, let me think. Uh, so I, I suppose during the summer program, um, I, during the summer program, if I could speak a little bit as, as to my experience, um, I remember sitting in class during one of the first weeks and um, we were trying to read something on the board, right, in, in, in Korean. Um, and reading in a foreign language, which you don't 100% understand, is a very embarrassing experience. Um, and there are very similar experiences that I've had when it comes to talking or trying to display, I guess, my proficiency in the language with other people. Um, and I think it's kind of easy to, to take those experiences and, and feel bad about your progress and things like that, um, especially if you live in a place like Korea where like people only speak Korean. Um, I've had a lot of experiences like that, but I think that if you could go into a program like Nisley with the mindset of improvement and, and knowing that, I guess, your, your language proficiency isn't who you are and, and doesn't define you in a way, um, I think that makes you a lot more open to progress. And it, it, I think it gives you a, a better, I guess, having, having a strong reaction to, to stuff like that, I, I think that's a really important trait when you, when you do an exchange program like this thing. yeah 
Great, thank you so much for sharing. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions right now. Uh, so I just wanna take this time to conclude um, and share some resources. Um, and also, you can also read student and alumni stories about NISLI at NISLI Interactive, which is hosting today's session. So I'm also gonna put that into the chat. So those are those two links. Um, and also before everyone goes, I really wanna uh, request a favor of you all, which is to complete this post event survey. We're trying to create exciting events for everyone that helps them learn more about the NISLI program and gets them excited about it. So if you can respond to this exit survey so we can create great events for you, that would be awesome. It will only take a minute, I promise you. Um, but please check out those links. Uh, you have some great alumni that you can connect with now. And I hope that everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you so much to our alumni guests, especially I really enjoyed everyone's presentations. They were great panelists. So thank you so much. And thank you for all the attendees for joining us. Please fill out this form if you're able to. And good night.